Funding for Reading Rainbow is provided by Country Inns and Suites, where you can borrow a book at our Read It and Return Lending Library and return it on your next day. Country Inns and Suites by Carlson, committed to literacy. And by a ready-to-learn television cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Education through the Public Broadcasting Service. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Butterfly in the sky I can go twice as high Take a look It's in a book Reading Rainbow I can go anywhere Friends to know And ways to grow Reading Rainbow I can be anything Take a look It's in Welcome to the bumpiest taxi ride in Boston. Our camel's name is Ah. It's an Arabic word. It means brother. Oh, <laughs> brother. <laughs> we usually think of camels as moving across the deserts of Egypt. In fact, camels are called ships of the desert and are right at home with the huge figures of the Sphinx and the pyramids. These mountains of stone were built thousands of years ago by the ancient Egyptians, and today they are known as one of the seven wonders of the world. The pyramids were burial monuments for the kings and queens of Egypt, silently guarding their secrets of the past. Today, Ach is taking us on a journey into the history and mystery of ancient Egypt to unravel the secrets of Egyptian mummies. Mummies? What are they? How are they made? And who made them? Do you know what a mummy is? Your mom. It's someone wrapped up. One eye, one nose, one mouth, one ear. Mummies walk like this and two bodies. A person that's all wrapped up and put underground for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> People have lots of ideas about what mummies are, and some are more fantasy than reality. But this book has all the facts wrapped up. It's called Mummies Made in Egypt. Mummies Made in Egypt Written and illustrated by Aliki Read by Corrine Orr Ancient Egypt was a long, narrow country divided in half by the Nile River. The land beyond was desert. There the ancient Egyptians buried their dead. The ancient Egyptians had one great wish. That wish was to live forever. Egyptians believed that after they died, a new life began. They would live in their tombs as they lived on Earth. In order for a person to live forever, the body had to be preserved or mummified. A mummy is a corpse that has been dried out so it will not decay. The earliest Egyptians were mummified naturally. The corpse was buried in the ground. The hot, dry sand of Egypt dried out the body. But as time went on and burials became more elaborate, people learned how to embalm 
or mummify their dead. Embalmers became so expert that the mummies they made remained preserved for thousands of years. Mummification was a long, complicated, and expensive process. It took 70 days for embalmers to prepare a body. First, they took out the organs. They started with the brain. Then, the inner organs were removed. The body cavity was stuffed with bundles of a chemical called natron. Then the whole body was covered with natron, and the corpse was placed on a slanted embalming bed with a groove at the bottom. Fluids from the corpse dripped into a container. Natron dried the body out the same way the sand had. After 40 days, the natron packs were removed. The dried, shrunken body was sponge clean and brushed with oils, ointments, spices, and resin. The arms were crossed, and the mummy's fingernails and toenails were covered with caps of gold. The mummy was adorned with jewels of gold and precious stones. Then the body was carefully bound with long, narrow strips of linen. Fingers, toes, arms and legs were wrapped individually. Every few layers were glued together with resin. After 20 layers, the mummy's body took on its normal size. The bound head was covered with a portrait mask. The mask, too, was bound. Then the whole package was wrapped in a shroud and given a last coat of resin. The mummy was finished. Meanwhile, skilled artists, sculptors, and carpenters prepared for the burial. They made the coffin, or a nest of coffins like these, for the mummy. The coffins were painted inside and out with gods, goddesses, and magic spells of protection. A splendid sarcophagus, or stone box, was made to hold the mummy's coffin. The walls of the royal tombs were carved and painted with scenes from Egyptian life. A long, solemn funeral procession took the mummy to the tomb. As years went by, tombs became bigger, stronger, and more elaborate. Pharaohs, or Egyptian kings, had pyramids built for themselves. Pyramids were huge stone monuments. They were magnificently carved and painted. When the funeral procession came to rest at the tomb, the mummy was put into the sarcophagus, which was covered with a heavy stone lid. The entrance to the tomb was sealed up with a wall of stone slabs. At last, the mummy was in its eternal resting place. Thanks to Aliki's book, we've unwound some of the mysteries of mummies. But where do you go to see a mummy face to face? Well, if this were ancient Egypt, Akhir could take us to a pyramid. But we're in 20th century Boston, and our destination, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, which has one of the largest collections of mummies in the United States. Oops. Let's go. actually standing next to real mummies. They're over 3,000 years old, and what makes them even more special 
is that we know who they were. Now this is the coffin of a mummy known as Tabes, and it's encased in plexiglass to protect it. When Tabes lived in ancient Egypt, she was a singer in the temple choir. The beautiful paintings on her coffin call her the Songstress of Amun. The paintings also tell us that Tabes was married to a barber who shaved the heads of the temple priests. This is the mummy of Nes Mut At Nehru. Her coffin says that she was the lady of the house. Now this probably meant that she took care of a home and possibly children. Her mummification was very costly because of the fine linens and the beautiful beadwork adorning the body. Mummies were hidden for centuries deep within the protective walls of the pyramids. Mummies were also buried in other sacred places like the cliffs of the Valley of the Kings. The mummies were laid to rest in beautiful burial chambers that were cool, dry, and dark. Hundreds of paintings decorated the walls with scenes of ancient Egyptian men and women silently working, suspended in time for thousands of years. People have always wanted to look beneath the wrappings of the mummies to see what's really underneath there. But that can be a pretty risky business because mummies are extremely fragile. I guess you would be too if you were over 3,000 years old. Touching or moving mummies too much can cause them to crumble. So, how do we get a look at them? Well, let's go to Kalamazoo, Michigan and find out. Mummies aren't moved very often, but this is a special occasion. This mummy has a doctor's appointment. The mummy's head was unwrapped before it was donated to the Kalamazoo Public Museum, and now the curator wants to find out more about the mummy. Today, we'll look under the wrappings as 20th century medicine probes secrets that are over 2,500 years old. This is the CT scanner room at Bronson Methodist Hospital. The CT scanner is a special kind of x-ray machine that takes detailed pictures without damaging the mummy. The x-ray session is being supervised by Dr. Robert Fosmo, a radiologist, and Dr. Lorelei Corcoran, an Egyptologist. Patient? Mummy. Age? About 2,500 years. Physician? Myself. All right, let's see what the CT can show us that's beneath the wrappings. There we have it. That's fantastic. What can we see here on the screen? Well, beneath all of the wrappings, we have the mummy. Here's the head. Here are the eyes. This is the nose. Here is a mouth where you can see the teeth, the jaw, the neck, hands. The hands are crossed on the chest. We can even see the individual fingers of the hands. The CT scan shows a skeleton in good condition, 
but it also indicates some dental problems. These are the teeth, and they are very much worn down, flattened. Many are missing. They're really in extremely bad shape. I think it was the sand that's responsible for that. They lived on a desert, and the sand would get into their bread and all of their food. Every time they ate, the sand would wear down their teeth. This is the head. We see the eyes. They're intact. You see the sinuses. They are clear, except the central sinus region, which is white. Probably in this case, the brain was extracted through the nose. This is the pelvis, and we can tell this is a female by the shape of the pelvis. Also, I see a certain whiteness of the joint. This often follows childbirth. So she was a mother. Correct. The x-rays tell us part of the story. But we also want to know, what did this mummy look like? Using the CT scans, a forensic artist will create a model of her face. The first step in the reconstruction of the mummy is to make life-size drawings from each of the scans. Ray Evenhaus uses the CT scans to create an exact three-dimensional replica of the mummy's skull. The next step is to transfer the drawings onto styrofoam board, which gives me a layer in the skull. And then when we stack all the layers on top of each other, we've recreated the original skull. I then have to cut small pieces of blue plastic to indicate the tissue depths over the specific areas on the skull. The skin and the muscle on the face are at different thicknesses in different areas and the markers tell us how thick the clay it should be in those areas. The eyes really help the face come alive. After the model is finished, I have to add coloring to the face. In the lips, for example, I use a soft red color. The final touch in this particular sculpture was adding the wig. It's pretty remarkable to see a face come alive from 3,000 years ago. I just thought I'd check on Ock, put some more money in the meter. You know, it's easy to buy some time for parking so Ock won't get towed away. But it's a lot harder to buy some time for ancient objects like mummies. So talented people use unusual techniques to make sure these treasures stay around for thousands of years to come. Hi, I'm Mimi. Hi, LeVar. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. This is Mimi Levesque, and she works here at the Conservation Laboratory at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Mimi, what are you doing here? Well, I'm cleaning a mummy of a little cat, LeVar. You mean they actually mummified animals, too? That's right. They mummified them as religious offerings. Do you have any other mummified animals here? Mm-hmm. Look, we have a little mummy of a lamb. No, wait. How do you know that that's a lamb there? Well, you can see his eyes here and the ears, they were put on in linen at the back. Uh -huh. And then the mouth was done in linen at the front. And then they wrapped him up like that. I see. And what's this over here? That's a mummy of a crocodile. Really? Yeah. There's his head. That's right. Right? And his body is here. Uh huh. And this would be a tail. That's right. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So how do you know that this is really a cat? With this one, you can see it was made to look just like a little cat. It has its head here, and then little buttons were put underneath the linen to make it look like eyes. 
and linen ears were put on the outside. And where's his tail? The tail would have been all wrapped up inside. Mm -hmm. And these squares on the top, these are just decorations for the mummy? That's right. Now, what were you doing with the cat when I came in, Mimi? Well, I was cleaning the cat. I'm taking the dirt off of the surface of the linen first. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm going to do is take off these little moth casings. Moths somehow got onto it, and they were eating the linen, just like they would eat your sweater. See the little moth casing right here? Well, I'm going to take it with these tweezers very, very gently. I want to make sure I don't disturb any of the linen underneath. And I'm just going to peel it up and take it off the surface. Wow, that's amazing. See this other little one right here? I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to loosen it with the tweezers and pull it very, very gently right out. Now I can use my brush to take the last of the dust out. Now, see how much cleaner all that looks now? You know, this place really is sort of like a laboratory, isn't it? Well, it really is a laboratory. We've got all kinds of microscopes and other technical equipment here to help us work on the art. As a matter of fact, Suzanne here is looking under a microscope right now at a little object. She needs it to be able to see all the areas of loose and flaking paint really close up. She's going to be taking a hypodermic syringe and injecting those areas of flaking paint with a special adhesive that will set them right down. We also use special chemicals and cleaners like this powder that Carol is putting onto the object. She'll rub it around very gently with a white cloth and then brush it into a little pile and vacuum it up. And now I've got someone I want you to meet. Really? Yeah, we've been working on him a long time. This is my friend Iti. He's a mummy who's 4,000 years old. Really? 4,000 years old? That's now, right. why is he here in the conservation lab? Well, we've been taking care of him for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. When he was in the ground, termites got into the tomb and they ate these big holes into his linen so that his linen was really in the shreds that you see underneath. Mm -hmm. And so what we've had to do is take some silk and we dyed it to match his original linen color and then we were able to wrap it around him almost like a silk stocking so that it would protect what was left of the linens and make sure that nothing further deteriorated. And to keep it from falling out. Huh? That's right. Well, thanks, Mimi. Thanks for showing us the lab today. Thanks for coming, LeVar. Come back again soon. I will. You know, it's important to take care of these treasures from the past so that people can continue to admire and study and to read about them. So, if the lure of mummies has you in its spell, then here are some books that you're bound to dig. But you don't have to take my word for it. Hi, my name is Emily. I'd like to take a little bit of your time to tell you about an interesting science book. It's called I Can Be an Archaeologist by Robert Pickering. Archaeologists are scientists who study how ancient people lived. They look at clues that people left behind hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Some of the clues are big, like the houses people lived in and the walls they built. And some of the clues are small, like the coins people used and the tools they made. When I grow up, I want to be a scientist. So this book was very exciting for me. And if you're interested in how people lived in the past, pick up I Can Be an Archaeologist. Hi, I'm Chris. Did you know that crocodiles go to school with lunch boxes and pencils? They do in this hysterical book, Bill and Pete Go Down the Nile. This is a story about a crocodile named Bill and his toothbrush, who is also a bird, named Pete. When they go to school, they learn about Egypt, their homelands, and the Nile River. Their teacher takes them on a class trip to see the mummies, pyramids, and all sorts of things that are in Egypt. The exciting part of the story comes at the end, but I don't want to give it away, so I'll only tell you that somebody winds up being a mummy. You ought to read this book because it's a riot 
And since most kids can't take a real trip down the Nile, this book is the perfect substitute. I give it a thumbs up. Where can you go to find ancient artifacts, new paintings, and word sculptures all under one roof? A museum, of course. Or you can try reading the book I just read called Visiting the Art Museum. It's about a family with kids who don't want to go to a museum, but their mom and dad take them anyway. When they get there, they see a variety of things and discover that a museum can be very interesting after all. They see Egyptian pharaohs, lots of sculptures, and beautiful paintings. My favorite part was when they were visiting the knights in shining armor because I love medieval times. I'm Jeremy Clapperman, and if you can't go to the museum today, why not get this book where you can explore lots of worlds that are new to you? Museums are like giant time capsules that give us glimpses into the past. And the more we discover about other times and places, like ancient Egypt, the more there is to discover. Hey, buddy, is this your camel? Oh, no! Excuse me, officer, is there some problem? Oh, I'm sorry, buddy, but uh, you're out of time. <laughs> oh, well, I guess we are. I'll see you next time. Ah. Today's Reading Rainbow books are Mummies Made in Egypt by Aliki, published by Thomas Y. Kroll. I Can Be an Archaeologist by Robert B. Pickering from the I Can Be series, published by Children's Press. Bill and Pete Go Down the Nile by Tommy DePaola, published by G.P. Putnam's Sons. Visiting the Art Museum by Lorene Krasny Brown and Mark Brown, published by by E.P. Dutton. Funding for Reading Rainbow is provided by Country Inns and Suites by Carlson, offering a family-friendly atmosphere and the Read It and Return Lending Library, where you can borrow a book and return it on your next day. And by a ready-to-learn television cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Education through the Public Broadcasting Service. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Doink.